During the summer of 2005, an international team of INA archaeologists and graduate students from the Nautical Archaeology Program at Texas A&M University came together to initiate the excavation of a Roman ship wrecked off the Aegean coast of Turkey at Kizilbrun. This part of the Turkish coastline is well known to many in INA as it lies just minutes beyond Tektashbernu, the site of a 5th century BC classical Greek shipwreck excavated between 1999 and 2001. Our earlier success in overcoming the logistical difficulties of living, diving, and working at Tektosh Bernou made the current INA team uniquely qualified to carry out the excavation at nearby Kizilbrun. With the help of engineer Robin Piercy, we constructed a modest but comfortable camp complete with artifact processing area, a large central galley for meals and meetings, and a dorm capable of sleeping six. The rest of the team slept aboard Ina's research vessel Virazon, which was anchored just in front of the camp alongside the catamaran Milawanda. Donnie Hamilton, president of Ina, served as the project director and Deborah Carlson as the team's archaeological director. What brought us to this remote and harsh environment were the remains of a marble carrier, what the Romans called a novice lapidaria, or stone ship. Eight massive stone column drums, each one over three feet tall and nearly five feet in diameter, stacked neatly in four pairs and topped by two large rectangular stone blocks and what appears to be a Doric capital. Set one atop the other, these eight drums and capital would have comprised a single column almost 30 feet tall, likely destined for the facade of a temple or other monumental structure. But Doric architecture, which developed on the Greek mainland in the 6th and 5th centuries BC, was not at all popular among the Romans, who much preferred the Corinthian and Ionic orders. It seems likely that this enormous column was intended to repair or update an existing Doric structure somewhere in Asia Minor. Consider the temple of Asclepios on the island of Kos, completed in the middle of the 2nd century BC and one of the Greek world's greatest healing sanctuaries. Back at Kizilbrun, following the morning meeting each day, we left camp aboard Milawanda for the two-minute voyage to the tip of the Cape, where we tied off to three mooring lines that ensured our position directly over the wreck site. As a stationary dive platform, the Milawanda functioned superbly, with enough compressors to support the airlifting and tank-filling needs of 15 divers. Twice every day, team members suited up to make their descent to the chilly waters 150 feet below. Once on site, they worked in 20-minute shifts on any one of a number of tasks, including chiseling concretion, scrubbing the marble elements, photographing, measuring, and excavating using airlifts, large, nearly vertical suction pipes. Excavation around the eight column drums revealed bits of the ship's hull in the form of wood fragments and over 250 fasteners, most of them clenched copper or copper alloy nails, some of them still encased inside the original wooden trenels. More extensive remains of the ship's hull are expected to be preserved under the drums, which are estimated to weigh as much as six tons apiece. The column wreck is one of five in the immediate area, discovered on the 1993 INA shipwreck survey directed by Jamal Pulak. In 2001, a second INA team returned to Kizilbrun under the leadership of Tufan Taranla to photograph and map the site. At the deeper end of the drum pile, divers observed a thin, flat, marble disc about four feet in diameter, which some thought might be an architectural element, perhaps a kind of shim associated with the drums. In late June, just weeks into the excavation, Murat Tilev uncovered a second large marble disc adjacent to the drum pile at the deeper end of the wreck. This second example was better preserved than the first, and not flat, but slightly convex. 
it quickly became clear that the objects in question were not discs, but wash basins or luteria. In the ancient world, luteria were used both in the household for everyday hygiene and in the sanctuary for ceremonial purification. Before the end of the summer, we successfully raised to the surface both basins, which weigh more than 400 pounds each. The area directly upslope of the drums is characterized by a secondary cargo of large rectangular marble blocks, most of which probably belong to the entablature of a Doric temple facade. Excavation in this area also revealed the presence of several roughly finished marble objects, including a very fine small lutarion or hand basin. Archaeologist Sheila Matthews spent many hours on the seabed, excavating between and around these large stone blocks. Much to her surprise, one block turned out to be an uninscribed headstone or stele. The ornamental pediment and central rosette is stylistically compatible with grave stele produced in nearby Smyrna, modern-day Izmir, during the 2nd and 1st centuries BC. The upslope area also produced important evidence for the ship's equipment in the form of two lead anchor collars and a lead sounding weight. Nearby was a large spool-shaped marble pedestal, which proved to be a base for one of the two larger luteria, as indicated by a square mortise in the top of the pedestal, which matches perfectly a square tenon that protrudes from the underside of each of the two basins. The roughly worked condition of these various marble objects suggests that they, like the column drums, were newly quarried when the Kizilbrun cargo was lost. The challenge of determining exactly when this happened is best approached through careful study of the ship's ceramic assemblage, which currently includes transport amphoras, mold-made bowls, very fine thin-walled cups, and Campanian black gloss pottery. Professor Mark Lawall, an amphora expert who visited the site briefly in August, speaks about the importance of the Kizilbrun. An unusual Egyptian type of amphora found on the wreck um, that requires a date very close to 100 BC. So, this unusual Egyptian type, on the one hand, helps us narrow the date to the very end of the 2nd century BC, or probably the beginning of the 1st century BC. And on the other hand, it raises a second point of great interest for the wreck, and that's the diversity of the cargo. This Egyptian type of amphora, with its two handles up high on the neck near the rim, is not generally found in the Aegean. In fact, this is the first time I've seen one in any of the many land sites that I work, work on. So this is a rare Egyptian type found in the Aegean, found on this wreck, but the wreck also has Italian amphoras, it has amphoras from south of the wreck site near the area of Knidos, it has amphoras from right near the wreck site near the area of Erythrae, and so it's a huge range of different types of amphoras from all over the Mediterranean. This wreck, its actual excavation, puts us far ahead of all the other known wrecks of this period um, in the Aegean and actually gives us a new data point for studying an important transition from the Hellenistic economies of the second century BC to the Roman economy in the Aegean starting in the very end of the second century and going into the first century BC and beyond into the because it can be difficult to know in the field which fragments will prove to be the more diagnostic, all artifacts are registered, sketched, measured, and photographed on a daily basis throughout the season. In 2005, most of the artifact processing took place in camp under sunny skies and overlooking calm seas. But on several occasions, Poseidon paid us a visit and stayed just long enough to remind us who was really in charge. Unlike Tektosh Bernou, Kizilbrun is completely exposed to the destructive Lodos winds that blow from the southwest. And when a Lodos storm arrives, there's nothing to do but cast off and head for cover. Under the skillful eye of Virazan Captain Fayaz Subai and the able seamanship of Milawanda Captain Bayram Kosar and First Mate Zafer Gul, the Aina fleet twice left Kizilbrun for the shelter of a nearby harbor causing us all to wonder if similar sea conditions had played a role in the demise of the column wreck, and more importantly, what will be left of the camp we built after the winter lotos of 2005. As the first excavation season at Kizilbrun drew to a close in late August, the team logged its thousandth dive to the wreck, and our camp began to overflow with artifacts, from small ceramic sherds to large marble basins, 
with lots of glass, bone, wood, lead, and copper in between.